Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's educational workshop. We're going to talk a lot about the therapies that help with stress, anxiety, and depression. A very important topic, and especially for those who deal with a lot of stress in uh, their lives or with people who have um, issues such as anxiety and depression. And um, it's an interesting, actually, educational uh, workshop because I've spent hundreds of hours researching these therapies as part of my doctorate also project. So I'm going to give you the nuggets and also a little bit of an overview of different therapies that are scientifically proven. So evidence-based therapies that are good for you when you experience stress, anxiety, and depression. So when you go, for example, um, to seek a counselor, seek um, a psychologist or a therapist, you know which kind of therapy you can uh, discuss even with them. They do. You can ask them um, now being more informed about this kind of uh, work. Uh, and there's going to be a lot of material, a lot of background for each therapy. I'll try to go through uh, this material swiftly. But if you have a, a pen and paper, it might help you. Or um, you can, if you watch this recording, you can rewind and, and see. And of course, Google, whatever resonates with you. And you think, oh, I haven't heard of that one. Or, oh, I actually have heard of this one uh, many times. Maybe it's time for me to uh, search for this kind of therapist. And trying to see, it's like a market. It's like you go into a vegetable market. This is the market for different therapies. And it's important not just to find the right therapist. We say it's important to have that rapport, that you know, good trust and connection. But also, it's important to find the right therapy. Uh, that works for you personally and uh, it's an interesting quest because sometimes it takes a long time and uh, therapies can be expensive so here it is a summary of evidence-based research-based therapies that work wonders with stress anxiety and depression there are quite a few of them so hopefully you can stay up until the end and then make an informed choice and of course, I'll start with some of the famous ones or quite well-researched. Some of them will be less researched than others, just by the sheer fact of the uh, presence of the institutions or foundations or um, a founding member or founder was maybe keen to support that therapy with research. And we have some that are more, let's say, popular or famous than others but it doesn't mean that they're uh, more effective. So what I am here to present is just the different descriptions and then you can make decision afterwards, okay? So let's start with one of the most famous, probably nowadays, it's quite a um, almost a staple food for, we call it in the therapy, is cognitive behavior therapy, CBT. CBT was developed by Aaron Back uh, back in the 1960s. It has been the golden standard in therapy to help alleviate stress, anxiety, and depression by helping change dysfunctional beliefs and thought processes, by recognizing, becoming aware, and changing distorted thinking and changing thought patterns. CBT has been a go to therapy for many practitioners. CBT is well researched to reduce stress, anxiety, and depression, including during the latest COVID outbreak. Um, there is some research that uh, was conducted as a meta analysis of randomized placebo controlled trials. That means they compared that therapy with, uh, with nothing. So if nothing is, is uh, given, uh, how much better this therapy would be, right? So it showed, it demonstrated moderately effic uh, effective treatment for anxiety disorders compared to placebo, indicating the need for more effective treatments, especially for PTSD or uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. CBT is especially helpful in times of crisis by improving the functioning of emotional regulation. That means how we control our emotions, and it can be effective for building healthy habits, 
proactive behavior and prevention. However, CBT has not been effective in complex cases of anxiety and stress disorders due to high remission rates and depression with co-occurring biological, psychological, and social factors. Okay. Next one is called uh, ACT or Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, also quite a popular one. So ACT was created by Stephen Hayes in the 80s and stems from behavioral therapy and cognitive behavior therapy. Instead of changing or focusing on issues, ACT aims at helping to accept feelings and emotions as they are. Okay, so just observe and being present and look at look at what's what comes up. ACT uh, has been effective with emotional disorders such as anxiety and depression applied in a group, internet-based, and individual setting, research has shown that ACT helps with psychological flexibility and better sustained well-being even with patients suffering from depression. It has also been researched and applied across cultures with effective outcomes for mental health. So there is something about accepting and uh, commitment to change or commitment to... Uh, um, to you know, being present, okay, not going deeper into the problems, but similar to CBT, we work where we work with the cognition to change the behavior because there is a belief that the way how we think influences the way how we feel, and the way how we feel influences the way how we act. So by changing the thought processes, we can change our behavior, and it's quite an effective way of doing it. Next, called prolonged exposure therapy or PE. Okay, so PE was created to deal with symptoms of stressful events and traumatic responses. It works by gradually exposing traumatic content to desynthesize the body's response to stressful stimuli, reducing the effect of trauma. Quite a, a tough one for me, uh, actually, but. Uh, a lot of people and the research supports that it works, especially in cases of PTSD, the post-traumatic stress disorder. This work is possible by changing cognitive and emotional responses to the stimuli with assistance from the therapist who mediates the process. Apart from reducing the effects of PTSD, PE, prolonged exposure therapy, has also demonstrated clinically efficacious results with comorbid, meaning together with conditions such as anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation, as it promotes stress reduction towards traumatic events or memory. Basically, as a therapist gradually presents or hears or facilitates the exposure to that traumatic event through the memory or through recording or through facilitating a similar input stimuli like it was during traumatic event, through Breathing, breathing through uh, some uh, cognitive exercise, but just being together with the therapist again and again and again, going through that step by step, increasing the amount and the intensity of that stimuli, uh, people seem to recover from trauma. Literally, it's going to be just a library of these therapies, okay? I'm not going to go deeply into each of them, but you can Google if you're interested, if something resonates with you, if you're curious about it. I encourage you to just get to know these therapies because they work. Eye movement and desensitization and reprocessing. Uh, it's called EMDR, okay? It's very famous now as well. A lot of therapists work with that. So what is it? EMDR has taken a prominent position in stress reduction, anxiety, and depression for more than three decades by offering effective protocols and research. It works by helping resolve unprocessed memories and stuck feelings through exposure to cognitive content. That means uh, some sort of content and we look at thoughts, beliefs, and memories. And bilateral eye movement, so literally moving eyes from left to right, from right to left. EMDR methodology developed by Francis Shapiro in the late 80s involves a set of eight phases of rhythmic 
um, eye movements like REM, the type of eye movements we have when we sleep in the are in REM sleep, we call them. And hand gestures such as a rhythmic alternate tapping on legs. So if, for example, there is no possibility to, to uh, move eyes or look at the finger moving from left to right, a therapist would use either a finger or an object. A person or a therapist can use tapping on, on, different, on, on legs to get the rhythm so the person moves their eyes or also have that um, experience through just tapping. That's apparently also uh, effective for processing traumatic events and reducing stress, anxiety, and depression. The next one is called somatic experiencing or SE. Now, somatic experiencing created by Peter Levine in the late 70s focuses on bodily sensations as maladaptive, fixated physiological states to assist in coping with stress. The main interest at the time of creation was in PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder cases, incorporating awareness, mindfulness, and body movements to change body reactions to trauma and stress. The unique component of SE that differs from, let's say, the prolonged exposure therapy is that no words are required, just body movements to make positive changes. SE is structured to be conducted within a 15 session protocol centered around mindfulness practice to balance the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. SE helps in regulating the bottom up processing system of the body. So, working with the body, soma in Greek is, means body. So it's what do we experience with our body? And focusing on those processes uh, helps go through trauma in a much more effective, productive way to alleviate that, to reduce that stress, anxiety, and depression. So very interesting uh, method. Here you can see fight or flight responses, how different organs get affected, fast breathing, acceleration of the blood pumping, uh, slow digestion, produces different kind of hormones, uh, muscle tension, the tunnel vision, the hearing loss, all that. So somatic experience is great with somatic manifestations of stress when people actually experience so-called like uh, mystery disease. You know, when you go to the doctor, and the doctor says, everything is fine. You're your results are fine, but you're actually hurting or you're feeling tired or you experiencing something in your body that is, you know it's not okay, that's a good therapy to look into. Also another one that's uh, close to a somatic experience is called sensory motor psychotherapy, SP. And here I have a little cartoon of two different characters, a girl and a boy, and one, the boy says, this is my depressed stance of looking down and slouching. When you're depressed, it makes a lot of difference how you stand. The worst thing you can do is straighten, straighten up and hold your head high because well, then you'll start to feel better. If you're going to get any joy out of being depressed, you've got to stand like this. And sensory motor psychotherapy works exactly with that, with the way how the body is positioning. Uh, itself during our emotional states. And the research behind S SP is strong in the sense that, you know, those stances, the, those movements, those uh, positioning, uh, still a limited research available, but S is one of the therapies developed by Pat o Ogden in the 70s, focusing on the body sensation as a prime regulation modality together with the attachment components. Also going back into how we were raised as children in the family where we come from and how our attachment to our parents was at that time. SP has mainly been used to treat trauma survivors and attachment dysregulation, such as childhood neglect and abuse, because children not always can express verbally. So these modalities are great at working with those who struggle to uh, avoid 
voice their cognitive processes out. So to explain, to reason. SP utilizes the bottom up approach the body up uh, from the body to emotion regulation with theoretical foundation in neuroscience and attachment theory. The main component is the body, which becomes an instrument for the change of sensations, feelings, thoughts, and behavior. Okay. Next one, BBT, brief behavioral therapy. Okay, what is that? BBT is an empirically supported therapy that stemmed from CBT, the cognitive behavior therapy, using Socratic dialogue, meaning asking open-ended questions. Motivational strategies, just going through motivational questions, you know, what would you like to do? What, what, what would you get from this? You know, what's your goal, et cetera. Collaborative, collaborative uh, planning and active listening techniques and positive regard toward impacting psychopathology. BBT is effective for cost-effective therapy solutions for alleviating stress, anxiety, and depression, especially for minority populations. Due to its short and brief nature, it's applied in various settings and fields, including medicine, pediatrics, and dentistry. The main difference between CBT and BBT is the time required for sessions. BBT is the compression of 12 to 20, sometimes CBT sessions into four to eight sessions, focusing only on a few session bound areas so that they don't go holistic, they go laser target those areas that are uh, problematic, let's say. The client becomes aware of the limited number of sessions available and aims to progress to achieve the goal established during the first session within the time allocated. Fascinating, right? So it's a placebo effect, but also it's kind of a, you know, when, when you know that you have only very limited time available, you juice it, as they say. <laughs> okay, next one. Psychodynamic psychotherapy, PDP. PDP is derived from earlier models of psychoanalytic perspective created by Freud, Klein, and Jung, focusing on subconscious processes that influence behavior and feelings. In addition, PDP has elements of ego psychology, attachment theory, object relation theory, and self-psychology. Operating on an interpretive supportive continuum, PDP aims to elicit insights and making unconscious desires and patterns more conscious. So very much embracing the uh, psychoanalysis or psychodynamic approach into the psychotherapy. Okay, so PDP is clinically supported as an effective therapy for elevating stress, anxiety, and depression, especially in children and adolescents. PDP also has a brief therapy option, which has been effective and alleviating symptoms of depression. That's, that's great. And we'll talk a little bit about that, the, the shorter version in, 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 the short, in, in a few slides. The next one, I love this one. It's called Solution Focused Psychotherapy, SFP. Solution Focused Psychotherapy, uh, created by Steve DeShazer and Insu Kimberg in the late 70s, considers that all solutions are already available inside an individual. And in order to help alleviate anxiety, stress, and depression, it focuses on the positive solutions and resources of individuals. And that's it, just the positive solutions. Imagine that. Emphasizing solutions rather than problems, SFS is one of the outcomes of positive psychology and strength-based psychology utilizing miracle questions. For example, what if you had all the resources on this planet? What would you what would you do to fix this issue? Or what if you woke up and you had a perfect day? What would you do and how would you feel? Also, they utilize reframing. Example, in other words, you have had a learning experience you can draw from. Or when you say you couldn't, what was it that you chose to prioritize more? Yeah, position in, in a positive. The solution focused psychotherapy has a wide range of applications across fields of work and well-being, including the education sector, medicine, uh, COVID pandemic-driven anxiety, and social anxiety reductions. Next one 
is called DBT, Dialectic Behavior Therapy, created by, Mar by Marsha Linehan in the late 80s to prevent suicide and treat borderline personality disorder, DBT combines elements of mindfulness, distress, tolerance, interpersonal effectiveness, and emotion regulation, which are important skills for many mental health issues, including stress, anxiety, and depression, and even bipolar disorder. Delivered in a 12-week program, it has been shown to improve psychological well-being and decrease emotional reactivity to stress, allowing for improvement in areas of anxiety and depression, similar to other therapies, yet there's a lack of research to support it. But there's a lot of people who have serious issues with dissociation, with suicidal ideation, depression, bipolar, um, and depression and the treatment of choice I normally hear is DBT. Next one is called MBSR, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. John Kabat-Zinn first created MBSR in the late 70s. The main goal was to support individuals to approach life events with resilience and emotional stability by being aware of the emotions arising and mindfully accepting them as they are. Rooted in Eastern philosophy and traditions with aspects of Western psychology, the MBSR courses generally last eight weeks and promote self-awareness, personal development, and general well-being. So some uh, studies such as Crane's at, and Others in 2022 reported the inconsistency of MBSR in improving cognitive function in cases of depression, mainly based on the inconsistency of terminology and methodology. However, despite some controversy in terminology, MBSR has been effectively applied across many fields of healthcare and age groups. So we talk about meditation and mindfulness, and here is a mindfulness-based stress reduction therapy that uh, one can learn. The next one is an interesting and very um, known to many, but very interesting that short, uh, intensive short-term dynamic psychotherapy. What I mentioned earlier, uh, kind of the, the shorter version uh, of the old psychoanalytic approach. ISTDP, Intensive Short-Term Dynamic Psychotherapy, was created by Habib Davanlu in the 60s out of frustration with the length of psychoanalysis and the relatively limited e efficacy of psychoanalytic psychotherapy. I agree uh, in the frustration, uh, myself included. I actually find it very uh, frustrating to be in a psychoanalysis for so many years and so expensive, so, um, mm, okay, consistent, yes, but questionable in terms of brief results needed. Incorporating insights from interpersonal neurobiology and effective neuroscience, Devon Liu collaborated with Michael Ballin from the Tavistock Clinic in the UK to formulate a better therapy to treat symptoms of stress, anxiety, and depression. As a result, ISTDP has been a go-to therapy in cultures with minorities and complex trauma where talking therapy failed to be effective for symptoms of depression and anxiety. Here we go. So it's still a psychopathological uh, based model with you know, dynamic forces such as, you know, there's a piece of a sexual dynamic force, a primitive murderous rage or pain of trauma to bond or bond attachment, the guilt, the grief, the character resistance, the resistance against emotional causes. But there's a lot of a briefness and, and that's, that's a promising uh, thing for psychoanalytic approach. 
here is a very interesting one, Accelerated Experiential Dynamic Psychotherapy or AEDP. This is one of my favorite new ones. Um, it has four pillars and was created by Diana Forsha in the early uh, 2000. AEDP draws on attachment theory, body-focused approaches and talking therapy to help people with trauma, anxiety and depression. With limited data to support the approach's validity, AEDP is a relatively new modality and has been clinically applied to cases of anxiety and depression. AEDP postulates that humans are wired for resilience. With the help of an AEDP therapist, it aims to uncover the innate coping mechanisms to reduce and manage stress, trauma, anxiety, and depression. Okay, so there is this whole focus on the trust between the patient and the therapist and establishing that so it's not like a disconnected person who you know like a psychoanalytic approach would uh, just a patient would lay uh, sit on the couch and the uh, therapist would just not even look at that person but just hear what they say here's a much more engaged approach and the therapist would share very as i would say lovingly or very engaging uh their stories as well sometimes and connected through the heart and their body uh, so there's a the belief that the the power of being seen and understood is so important for um this ability to trust because trauma creates a sense of distrust or a, a sense of disconnection so how do we bridge um how do we connect with the with the topics that are very hard, traumatic, is through establishing that relationship. An accelerated experience, as well as experiential, also dynamic sort of body movement, and um, sometimes even touch. So there's that piece of therapists could hold hands or hold shoulders and working through defenses and guiding the person to go to the place where um, the shift and transformation happens. Another one of my favorites, internal family systems, IFS therapy. And here's a cartoon where a Matryoshka, or the Russian doll, comes to uh, an airport to buy a ticket or like a, a checkout. And the person, cashier says, one ticket, really? So internally family systems was created by Richard Schwartz in the 80s. And originally a product of a systemic stance and person-centered therapy, working with anorexia, bulimia patients, but later became a standalone alone therapy popular with PTSD and war veterans uh, to treat anxiety, depression, and stress-related symptoms. IFS looks at the person as a system of different inner parts that can play the roles of protectors, managers, or exiles. The main goal of IFS is to create a healthier relationship between the parts of this and the parts of us, internal parts of our sort of internal system and our self or the self, the core energy that we get the resources and actually also the, the deepest and, and unchangeable part. Integrating different aspects of the personal history into a more functional relationship and behavior. IFS has shown clinical evidence of effectiveness in cases of depression and extreme stress in the form of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Very effective strategy and therapy modality. I really enjoy using that and my patients also uh, report successful recoveries and they love this process because they are nourishing, sometimes fun, very unexpected it's kind of a meeting uh, the internal parts of us that uh, that's very deep but also manageable it creates a tool to manage on in the uh, in, in within the therapy but also on our own without the need of a therapist another new therapy that you probably have never heard of uh, it's called brain spotting therapy. Okay. David Grant called, created brain spotting in 2003. 
as an updated technique of EMDR, the eye movement desensitization and processing. Using a pointer to shift a client's visual focus based on where it is mainly connected to a distressing event. Although limited research is available to support the technique, brain spotting therapy is a recent popular modality for therapists working with clients who suffer from symptoms of PTSD, anxiety, and depression. Connected often with EMDR, brain spotting is a body-mind therapy that can be applied to cases of PTSD because of the ability to to spot the connection between the traumatic event and changing the visual focus while processing, moving to a better place emotionally. Very interesting. I actually haven't tried that myself. So I've just researched, I know about it, but I've all of the other ones I've experienced, but this one I haven't. It's quite a recent one. Next. Okay, narrative exposure therapy, NET. Maggie Schauer, Thomas Albert, and Frank Neuer at the University of Constance in Germany in the late 90s developed NET as a pragmatic treatment approach for victims of organized violence such as war and torture in response to the Balkan War. Several cl clinical trials have shown improvements in symptoms of PTSD, anxiety, and depression only after three sessions of NET, suggesting that brief NET could be both uh, applicable and uh, uh, effective in traumatized populations. NET has also been applied to children from traumatized families, such as refugees and victims of war, suffering from anxiety and depression. And what NET is good at is that unpacking the story, narration from pre-trauma event, through the trauma event, after trauma event, and creating the life story, looking at it from a uh, a larger picture, but also going into that uh, cognitive processes, emotional, so physiological, the meaning making and sensation as you read the narrations, you, the written narration, it's a very powerful exercise. Okay, so here we go. We have covered, you know, one part of the stress uh, alleviating stress therapies, but also what I wanted to share at last is one of the very important, one of the therapies that I love the most and I use pretty much every day with my patients. And as I'm a director of Virginia Satir Institute in the UK and a psychologist, I also was quite surprised to find out that Satir, Virginia Satir, created the Satir model of therapy and used okay at that time she didn't have the all the evidence of neuroscience and the uh, the polyvagal theory and all this research behind this effective therapies but what i really found out is that a lot of satir model components are connected to the therapies and all in, under one umbrella the satir model sm so for example elements of cbt are in the iceberg metaphor of Virginia. When we talk about behavior above the surface and the feelings and the thoughts and the perceptions and the meaning making and the expectations below the surface line of the iceberg. For example, ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy has some uh, link to the satire change model. How do we accept, how do we become aware and accept things as they are, because we're going through a change process. If it's chaos, it's chaos. We just accept that. We don't change anything. Uh, if we go through a denial, okay, we're in denial stage. It's a beautiful change model that, that Virginia Satir laid out. The prolonged exposure therapy, again, evidence-based, is very much presented in the Satir model of uh, instances and family sculpting. The communication stances where we have to um, embody and you know go through that traumatic memory of our parents being dis in distress or me being in distress with uh, a certain emotion uh, event a person my partner and facing that but then moving to a place of better or a better place the somatic experiencing or sensory motor therapy has a lot components that are very similar in the family sculpting of satire or the touch and the body work because 
she used a lot of kinesthetic and somatic uh, elements in the way how she worked. The, um, all this abbreviation even get me sometimes, <laughs> you know, puzzled, puzzled, like, what are those? PDP, psychodynamic psychotherapy, right? PDP has a big link to triad work. The, the original triad, mama, papa, child in the satire is the cornerstone of satire's work. When she does, or she did um, family therapy and she was the grandmother or the mother of family therapy, she worked with the original triad. And that is very much psychodynamic uh, link. Then we have solution-focused uh, psychotherapy, very much positive-based or person-centered. Virginia was all about positive regard, validating, creating a, just the sense of being accepted. She was the pioneer of positivity in psychology. She didn't want to look at pathology. She wanted to look at the resources, the positive uh, aspect, the gem uh, of the person that very essence of, of the person. The mindfulness, right? The mindfulness-based psychotherapy. Every session, satira would start with a centering meditation, awareness and centering, focusing on the body. The intensive, uh, short-term dynamic psychotherapy, ISTDP, connected to a satire tool called five family rules or five uh five things that uh we learn not to do in uh, childhood and that creates kind of a stigma or schema or uh that dynamic where we try to avoid unless we really face it, we try to avoid it, we go into, that goes into subconscious, unconscious, and all that psychodynamic uh, part of the, the element, you know, that's very much connected. IFS, internal family systems, is just a parallel to parts party that she did, a party of our inner parts, that family system. Net, the narr narrative um, uh, therapy, right, is when satire would take the history of, of, of the family, of the person, and create a family tree or, or a very elaborated kind of genogram where it's not just the who was born when, but what kind of events shaped a person's identity, the history of parents, grandparents, great great parents, what kind of triumphs and failures and shocks and traumas affected and this is a family history narration. So all of those, you can also get under an umbrella of the satire model in the country. There's so many satire offices around the world. If you just connect even in your own language to the satire institution or uh, maybe the satire global, the international network of the Virginia satire, you will be surprised how you will go in through a program or through a course through one 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 work, how many of the therapies will be under your belt? Anyway, I just wanted to thank you for being amazing listeners, for learning new things. I'm sure you have learned fun listening to these therapies. I did. I mean, I thought I knew many, many therapies, but these some of the new ones I was quite surprised to find out. And I encourage you to go on YouTube and Google to learn more about those. And as you find the right therapist, but also therapy for yourself or your professional, you may train in uh, some of these. Anyway, I hope it was helpful, educative, and uh, it can also make your life a bit more enriching.